Okay, good morning, and thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to participate in this workshop. I'm really excited about the opportunity to present a paper today co-authored with Nina Pochnik at Dartmouth College, and tentatively titled so far, Entering and Exit of Informal Firms and Development. So why, do we, why would we be interested in informal firms? So first of all, as many of you in this workshop might be aware of already, there's a large literature that is emphasizing the importance of firm entry and exit in developing countries. But most of this literature has focused um, almost exclusively on formal firms, leaving us with relatively little evidence on the entry and exit of informal firms in developing countries. Why might this be important? Well, again, as some, some of you in the workshop are already familiar with this literature, informal firms represent the majority of firms in developing countries. They're likely an important influencer on aggregate productivity within a country. There's also growing evidence that they potentially face different distortions relative to formal firms, both in input markets and in output markets. They're an important source of household income. And lastly, just given the sheer scale of how many informal firms we're talking about in a typical low income country, they end up accounting for a large share of employment. So if we're interested in structural change questions with employment in, uh, in the background and understanding what's happening for informal firms, can be potentially very important. So we hope in this paper that we're able to contribute to the literature by essentially documenting several facts about entry and exit of informal firms. And here we're going to be specifically talking about non-farm firms in Vietnam, and we're using nationally representative panel data that covers a period of 15 years. This data is going to allow us to simultaneously examine entry and exit. We're going to be able to observe informal firms for a period of up to four years. Um, allowing us within that four year period to see entering informal firms and exiting informal firms. We can examine how entry and exit vary over this 15 year time period, which is longer than typically available um, in the literature. And also just given the sheer size of our sample, we can also see how this varies with the level of local development across 60 provinces in Vietnam. So we hope that this allows us to document facts about entry and exit more systematically than is usually possible. And we're also able to relate these patterns of entry and exit to characteristics and economic activities of the managers or the owners of these businesses, either before, or either before or after operating an informal business. And lastly, we're able to place this these entry and exit dynamics within the context of the, econ of the overall economy, because the underlying data, as I'll discuss in a, a few more slides, is coming from nationally representative household survey data, not from a firm survey. And so that allows us to observe using the same data set, the overall structure of employment within the economy. So obviously there's a really large literature about informal firms or sort of maybe more generally microenterprises in developing countries, particularly over the last 10, 15, 20 years from RCTs. Um, a relatively small fraction of these RCTs will actually study firm exit uh, as an outcome. So McKenzie and Pathausen have done a fairly extensive review and suggest that only about a third of these RCTs look at firm exit, even fewer look at firm entry. Some older papers um, use labor force survey data. Um, many of these come from urban areas and middle income Latin American countries, or there's been a number of papers using the, the Townsend Thai um, data. So in terms of our contribution, I think we most closely line up with the recent RESAT paper by McKenzie and Pathausen, where they provide descriptive evidence on small firm exit across 12 countries. So they've pooled data from a number of different, primarily RCTs, um, but also from just country surveys where possible. The samples tend to be relatively small, not nationally representative. And so we see our studies hopefully complementary. We're gonna focus on one country, Vietnam, but we're able to study exit and entry over a longer period of time and across um, economic development. So our data, for let's you know, spend a few minutes here explaining exactly what we mean by an informal business and what is our, our source of information on these businesses. In Vietnam, informal businesses are small private businesses that are not registered with the national government as an enterprise. Okay, so our definition here is going to be based on the registration status of the business. In comparison to Vietnam, all state, foreign, and collective businesses, they're legally required to register as an enterprise. As are all large private businesses, and by large we mean 10 or more workers, or private businesses that want to operate in more than one lo location. So most of our informal businesses, these are going to be small. The vast majority of them is just the owner, is the only person that works in them. About 25% of them have a second household member that works in the business as well. Our data comes from the 2004 through to the 2018 rounds of the Vietnam Household Living Standard Surveys. These are conducted every two years. It's a multi-purpose household survey with a relatively large sample, about 45,000 households in each survey, nationally representative with a rolling panel component. 
Each survey contains information on about 20,000 businesses. So that's in the repeated cross section, almost all of which are informal businesses. And the business module, so again, just wanna reiterate that this is not a survey of firms themselves, right? The information that we get is just from one part of this multi-purpose household survey. So it collects information on the industry of operation, the number of months that the business has been operating during the last uh, year. We know monthly revenue, the annual wage bill, um, and we also have some information on other expenditure items. And lastly, importantly for our purposes, we know whether the business being run by the household, whether it's an informal business, or in a very small number of cases, some of these households are running registered private enterprises. In terms of the panel size, across successive household surveys, we have about 20,000 panel households. And then again, roughly half of these households are resurveyed a third time. So we have about 9,500 panel households across three successive surveys. So this is relatively large nationally representative panel data. Um, and the, you know, has been pointed out by Chris Woodruff, among many others, data of this size um, is relatively rare in a low income country setting. So the data itself, as I mentioned, it's not a firm survey. So the, the household survey is not designed explicitly to track these businesses over time. So what we do is we take advantage of information about the business that's unlikely to change much within a two year period. And that's the industry of operation and the owner of the business to then allow us to try to construct a panel of businesses within the household. Okay. So in this con, so essentially we're matching businesses over time within a household. And within this context, I'll just spend a moment here to be clear about how we're going to define entry and exit. So entry in our case is going to be a business that operated in survey T plus two. So say, for example, in the 2006 survey, but within that household, we couldn't match that business to one that was being run in 2004. Okay. Similarly, exit is going to be a business that operated in survey T. So say, for example, the 2004 survey, but within that household, we're unable to match it to another business being run two years later in the 2006 survey. Okay. So almost certainly there's going to be some measurement error here in terms of our matching. Uh, in the paper, we try to go through a number of different robustness checks, which unfortunately I probably don't really have time for today, but if anyone wants to follow up um, in the chat uh, afterwards, I'm happy to discuss in more details. So the starting point for analysis in the paper is to just use the repeated cross sections to just see you know, what's happening in aggregate over this time period. So in this figure, we're plotting for the different surveys, 2004 to 2018, just the overall share of households that are operating a business. So the blue line is any business. This is gonna include both the informal businesses and those that are formally registered as an enterprise. Whereas the white dash red line, this is just businesses that are being um, operated by the household that are informal businesses. And the general picture here as Vietnam is rapidly developing during this 15 years is a, you know, a pretty consistent decline in the share of households that are operating in informal business from about 36% of households in 2006 down to about 31% uh, in 2018. The second thing that we do with the repeated cross sections is document how this varies across provinces. So like most low income countries and I mean really any countries, Vietnam has a fair amount of variation in terms of the level of development, in this case, across its 60 provinces. So on the horizontal axis, we're plotting provinces based on their per capita income in 2006. So we have a few far out on the right, that's Ho Chi Minh City, for example, and Binh Zuong. And then on the vertical axis, we're plotting within each province, the share of households that report operating an informal business. Okay, and we're plotting here for two years. We have in the um, solid blue, um, and so, yeah, just a quick there for Joe. Yes, we do know who in the household is running the business. Um, and we do have uh, ways that we deal with changing household composition. Um, if you allow me to, I'll set that aside for now, though, and I'll come back to it maybe in the chat whenever a bit more, more um, or the Q&A, whatever, more time. The blue, the solid blue circles here, this is the share of households in 2006. And then the um, hollow diamond shapes, this is the share of households within a province in 2018. You'll notice that it's upward sloping in general, right, in both time periods that the richer the province, the higher the share of households who are running a business. But this pattern has become flatter over time, right, such that between 2006 and 2018, in the richest provinces, we've seen a lot of net exit from the informal business sector. Okay. So with that repeated cross section information in place, we now want to turn to sort of the, you know, the real advantage of our data is where we can follow these businesses 
over an extended period of time and look at actual entry and exit by business. So we're plotting again, based on our, our surveys, we, on the horizontal axis, it's the initial year of each two survey panel. Um, the exit is in the solid blue circles and our annual entry rates are in the, um, the hollow square markers with 95% confidence, confidence um, bounds around them. And there's a couple key facts that emerge out of this first figure. First of all, you can see that the annual exit and entry rates are fairly high, right? This suggests that over a two year period, we see exit rates of about 36% of firms are gone two years later and about 35 to 36% of firms that are operating two years later are new, they weren't there before. Also, we see that our entry and exit rates are correlated over time. Uh, I'm not gonna show it here today, but it's in the paper that these exit and entry rates are also similarly correlated within industries um, and that they don't differ that dramatically across industries. Our exit rates are relatively comparable to those um, reported within McKenzie and Pathfiles and definitely within the range that they see across the countries um, that, they, that they're able to study in their paper. And then sort of here's a quick follow up to, to Joe's question already. We also see similar results of sort of a decline in the rate of entry and exit as Vietnam is developing. When we restrict the sample such that we're not including businesses that are run by individuals who are either joining or leaving the household within the panel period. And I'll have more to say on that in a few slides. We can turn as well to see how entry and exit rates vary with the level of local development across provinces. So again, on the horizontal axis here, it's that same variation in provincial income in 2006. So we have our richest provinces out here, Ho Chi Minh City and Binh Zuong. Again, like we saw at the national level, we see high correlation of entry and exit rates within provinces, right? which suggests to us that it's relatively important to simultaneously study entry and exit across markets. In a few slides, I'm gonna relate this to underlying variation within um, the local markets. And you know, just to kind of you know, highlight, um, that in general, the richest provinces have the lower um, entry and exit rates. This might be due to differences in the outside opportunities present in these uh, provinces, as these are areas where the formal sector is most developed already. One really interesting fact that we noticed once we started looking at the entrants and exiters is that they look remarkably similar in terms of the overall distribution of revenue. Okay? So here in this figure, we're taking advantage of our three survey panels and we're gonna pool across all of our three survey panels and look at the middle year, okay? So here, the solid blue line would then be the revenue distribution for firms that exist in the middle year of the three survey panel, but will have exited by the end of the panel. The um, small dashed red line is firms that exist in the middle year of the panel, but didn't at the beginning. So these are our entering firms. And then the last line with the, the long dash in green, this is the revenue distribution for firms that are continuing throughout the three survey panel. Um, in terms of, can we see exit followed by re-entry? Yes, we can see that um, at the household level. We don't have anything um, in the presentation today to show that, but we do absolutely see churning at the household level where you might have a household that is operating a business in the first survey, they're not operating a business in the second survey, and then they're operating a new business um, in the third survey, often a different member um, and a different industry. Um, a couple of key things that you know, we like to point out from this figure is that there's obvious um, evidence here of selection at work, that the revenue distribution for the firms that are gonna exit is shifted to the left relative to those who continue. But also importantly, we just see there's, you know, in aggregate, there's this, a tremendous amount of churning in terms of exiting and entering businesses but they're really just kind of replacing relatively poorly performing informal firms with new poorly performing um, informal firms, right? The entrants don't really look much different than the exiters. And this is at odds with a significant amount of evidence from formal firms in developing countries where the entering formal firms are outperforming those that are exiting. Here, we don't see that. We can also look at among the firms who enter, right? So these are new firms in our second survey relative to our first um, survey in the panel. We can then follow them up to see how many of them survive and conditional on surviving, do they lead to aggregate productivity improvements? So the first figure on the left here, this is um, plotted relative to the middle year of the survey. And this reports what share of entrants are still there 
two years later. Okay. Or sorry, not sorry, it's not those that survive, it's the share that exit had this flipped. Um, but you can see that it roughly hovers around sort of between 50 to 46, um, and then sort of around 48. So it's sort of in the range of 48, almost up to 50% of entrants are gone two years later. They don't survive. And the graph over here on the right, um, we're now going to take a look at this is conditional on being an entrant. We're going to split it up into the long dash green line is the entrants that don't survive. These are ones that are going to subsequently exit. The solid blue line, this is um, entrants in their year of entry who end up surviving, right? And you can notice that relative to the green line, relative to the ones who exit, the blue distribution is shifted to the right, right? So the surviving entrants in their first year, they perform better on average relative to the um, entrants that are going to exit. And then the third line that we plot here is the small dash red line, which follows up two years later and to look to see whether the revenue distribution has grown very much among the surviving entrants and it doesn't particularly grow. It's shifted a little bit to the right, but again, not a lot. Okay, thanks Robert. The last thing I wanna do in, our, in my remaining few minutes is look at um, what these managers were doing before or after to try to place it into sort of the larger context of what the underlying labor market opportunities look like. So what I have here in the highlighted, the red text um, two columns here is what activity the manager was doing before operating a business, right? So we're looking back one survey two years before, and we broke it up into eight different categories, three different wage worker categories, three different self-employment categories, were you not in the workforce? Um, and then our last category, were you not in the household? So you know, there's some underlying change in composition in the household happening here. And you'll see that you know, across, you know, um, before and after, that these shares are pretty highly correlated. We just see a lot of churning of, for example, business managers you know, leaving agriculture to start an informal business at the same time that there's a lot of managers leaving the informal business to return to self-employment in agriculture. Uh, in terms of the right tail of productivity distribution, Maggie, maybe I'm gonna leave that to the, to the Q&A, if that's all right. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. The next thing I wanna point out in terms of the activity levels and what else we know about the managers is we know, of course, what the grade level they have, what they've achieved. And you can see that, again, um, within activities, in terms of what they're transitioning to or from, the education levels are relatively similar. So again, I'll highlight the self-employment in agriculture, just because this is our largest category in terms of what the workers are transitioning to and from. And you'll see that, you know, sorry, what the owners are transitioning to and from. You'll see that those owners who are transitioning to and from agriculture, these are our least educated, other than just those who are wage workers in agriculture but there's just not a lot of transitions from wage work and agriculture. A lot of the informal business managers entering and exiting, they're the least educated in the workforce. Last thing I wanna point out here, um, oh, sorry, just a one quick kind of concluding slide. So, you know, given that we see a lot of transitions to and from the same activities by owners who are relatively poorly educated, it's perhaps no surprise that the revenue distributions of entrants and exiters look so remarkably similar, right? There's just a lot of underlying, underlying churning of managers with very similar characteristics who end up running relatively similar performing businesses. Okay. The last thing that I wanna highlight here is I've been focusing on the transition rates just among managers, but these transition rates also actually look relatively similar to what the overall economic labor market activities look like in the economy. So here on the last two columns, we're looking at all workers within Vietnam in our panel surveys. And again, just looking to see what they were doing, you know, sort of at the beginning survey or the end survey. And you can see that these ratios or these shares are, are relatively similar, right? So we get a lot of business managers, the owners transitioning to and from self-employment and agriculture. And this is consistent with, there's just a lot of workers in Vietnam who are in self-employment and agriculture. We see this transition from self-employment and agriculture falling over time as Vietnam is developing and there's fewer workers who are self-employed in agriculture. And it's also less common in the richer provinces. So if I have a minute or two just to kind of wrap up here, you know, I think one of the really nice things about our data is that we have this nationally representative panel data on informal businesses, allows us to document a lot of questions about entry and exit over time. We see this very high correlation between entry and exit rates 
we see that the share of households operating informal business has fallen over time, and that's particularly true in the initially richest provinces. Um, we see also this very striking overlap in the revenue distribution between entrants and exiters. So there's a lot of churning of poorly performing informal businesses just being replaced by new poorly performing businesses. And that a lot of this transition is you know, among um, business owners who have relatively similar education levels and they're transitioning to and from relatively similar activities. So we think that these dynamics have important implications for many development processes um, and outcomes that people might be interested, particularly, or at least to some extent, structural change. Because it may be in the poorest provinces, moving out of agriculture more often means moving into an informal non-farm business, not into the formal sector where that doesn't really exist very much yet. In comparison, the richer provinces moving out of agriculture is more likely to maintain a movement into the formal sector. Um, and this overall decline in the prevalence of informal businesses, this is consistent with a number of models such as one um, by Doug from a little while ago about that predict the movement away from small scale subsistence level businesses to more productive businesses with development. Um, but to our knowledge, most of these businesses typically abstract away from this simultaneous um, entry and exit. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Great start to the day. Um, who would like to uh, continue the discussion? Uh, start the discussion in after the presentation. Yeah, Christina. Yes, that's super interesting. Thank you, Brian. So my question was whether you can see more detailed codes of what sector uh, their informal businesses are in and what sector those people that transition out of the informal sector and into the formal sector go into and whether these two are correlated. So whether you can think of um, this is a, you know, pre room to 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 going into the same industry, but in the formal sector. Okay. And uh, Robert, just in terms of format, do you want me to collect questions or answer? Uh, maybe maybe let's collect some questions because, okay. for instance, I see uh, that there's a question by Heidson in the in the chat that seems compl somewhat complementary. Uh, exactly. Um, um, I see Alessandra. Go ahead, Alessandra. Can I go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for a super interesting talk. I thought like one of the things that um, surprised me most, I think, was the relationship that you showed at the beginning that there's more informal firms in richer provinces. I was wondering if you'd like dug into that a little bit. That's sort of the opposite of what I would have thought is true. Also, if we think about you know broad fact with development, does this have to do? Um, with there being just a lot more agriculture in the poorer ones? And if that's true, then what kind of explains that there's more of a shift there? I was wondering if you had some, some thoughts on that. Okay. I had a, yeah, if Go I ahead. may, uh, I had a, I posed something as a statement in the chat, but really it's a question. Um, you have these things that I'm interpreting as marginals from a Markov transition process uh, into and out of, uh, uh, into and out of these uh, enterprises, and it would be it would be really cool to see the Markov transition matrix, the full thing, uh, to really understand what's going on with the dynamics here. Is it possible? Is it is it unreasonable to think about estimating that with these data? Paco, hello. Do you hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, have a. Quick question, a, a paper, a recent, relatively recent paper that, uh, that is related is the work by Shen Kino in uh, 2014, looking at the life cycle of plants. That's a paper that focuses mostly on, uh, only on manufacturing, but they do a, an effort to have form, informal sector into, into it. So can you look at the same patterns on life cycles in your data and, and, and relate to, to them? That would be interesting. Yeah, that, that matches a question I also had. So you look at the, the impacts of entry two years after entering, but uh, also work on entry and exit in US uh, and other countries should suggest that this contribution grows over time um, due to this shakeout. Um, there's a question in the chat also from Doug on, um, um, on yeah, go ahead. Sure. It was just a comment, but also a question that it's striking the number of people you see moving from enterprise back into agriculture. 
makes me suspect that they're not actually leaving rural areas in the first place. And so if that's correct, that seems to suggest that in the Vietnam context, at least, structural change is to some extent taking place within location rather than um, necessarily being coincident with migration. And is, is that right? And, and if so, that's, that's interesting and probably different, I suspect, than what we'd see in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. Taryn? Oh, yeah. Um, hi, Brian. Um, mm -hmm. I, I uh, was wondering whether you, we can actually think about these informal businesses as sort of seasonal businesses. So we know how to think about seasonality of, of labor and agriculture. Um, but I'm wondering whether what's going on with these households, this is a little bit related to Doug's question, is that the informal businesses are kind of being used as shock absorbers for when agriculture is not doing so well. And so the, you wouldn't necessarily see this at the, at the whole local level, but if individual households are getting negative shocks and agriculture picking up informal businesses and then going back into agriculture after a year or so, I don't know whether you have kind of a long enough panel of, of any households to observe that kind of behavior. Um, so yeah, five minutes to answer. Is that uh, exactly? And you have a lot on your plate. So uh, yeah, okay. So thank you everyone for the, for the questions. Nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so I'll start at the top and try to work my way down. Um, yes, Christina, we do, we do have more detailed codes. Um, we have the industry codes at the two-digit level. So, for example, within manufacturing, we can distinguish between food and beverages versus textile versus garments, um, wood processing, um, et cetera. Um, and what we see is a lot of transitions not from the same industry. We see, you know, in particular, for example, so since we've got a third of our entrants are coming from self-employment to agriculture, they're coming into non-farm activities. Now, some of those are gonna be closely related, right? Some of this is food processing, which surely is sort of a secondary activity related to some of the underlying agriculture and you know, also kind of raises the questions of what exactly is the boundary between a farm versus a non-farm business. Um, but most of the transitions are to new industries. Even when people are leaving from wage work outside of agriculture to start a business, they are moving into a, a new industry at the two digit level. Um, Alessandra, in terms of the relationship in richer provinces, yeah, actually that really surprised us too. And we spent quite a bit of time looking into that. And it really is due to the underlying structure of um, sort of the breakdown between agriculture services and manufacturing. Um, the poor provinces is just, there's a really, really high share of employment still in agriculture. And so, you know, sort of by construction, the fact that we're looking at informal non-farm businesses, there's just not a lot of informal businesses there relative to the richer provinces where we see the share of businesses really growing because of the underlying growth in services, okay? Um, as we transition with a manufacturing from the poorest provinces to the richest provinces, the share of households operating a informal manufacturing business falls. And that picture I think is a little bit more consistent with what most people sort of think of as sort of the stylized fact about the decline. Um, if we put together farms and informal businesses, then we clearly get a decline in the number of businesses as provinces develop. Um, Ethan, the, the idea about the Markov transition matrix, you know, um, definitely we can do that with our data. Um, that seems like a, a really interesting thing that we could do to provide uh, a bigger context for what's happening in the overall labor market. Um, Francisco, the uh, life cycle um, descriptions out, it is something actually that a very, very early version of this paper um, looked at a little bit. Um, and we have the early surveys um, report the start year of the business. And so we can look at you know, do, do older businesses, you know, conditional having survived, do they hire more workers? Is their revenue higher? The answer is pretty much no. Um, so these, you know, once you survive, mostly it seems like you just survive and persist at pretty much the same level of activity. Um, maybe a little bit of revenue growth over time, but not much um, is associated with age. And definitely we see no pattern of older businesses being more likely to be hiring workers from outside the household or to be more likely um, to have actually made the step of registering as a formal enterprise as opposed to remaining an informal one. Um, so I guess that also kind of relates a little bit to Robert to your question about entry and exit growth over time in the US. Um, the, the dynamics here, um, you, we, our data only allows us to observe a firm um, up to three surveys. So we really can't track the same firm over time, but for the earlier surveys where we know the age, I think that's close and we can get to that. 
Doug, the question about migration is really interesting in Vietnam because the overall level of migration is actually relatively low. Um, but among young workers or young individuals, it's quite high. Um, so if you're looking at the age group, sort of late teens into late 20s, um, it's you know, between the um, two surveys, it's about 10% of that population is leaving the household. Unfortunately, the migration data in Vietnam doesn't tell us where they go when they leave the household, um, unless they specifically indicate that they're leaving for work. And if they do leave for work, they're basically going to the, the places that you would expect. So it's about 40% of the individuals who leave the household report doing so for work. Um, and they head to Ho Chi Minh City, Vinh Duong, Hanoi, the you know, most rapidly growing formal sector areas. Um, and then last, the last question, which I guess hopefully I have time for here. Taryn, um, your question about are these seasonal? Um, about 75% of the informal businesses are reported as being run all 12 months of the year. Um, and the manager reports doing it as their primary job around 70 to 80% of the time. It grows over the, the surveys. Um, a, lot of them, a lot of these owners will still have a second job. Um, so, you know, they might be running this as their primary job, but they're still doing, you know, say agriculture um, on the side. Um, in terms of whether they're, uh, these businesses are being run to absorb shocks, we haven't gone in that route yet. I, I think that's definitely an interesting follow-up thing to do. We kind of wanted to first to start by documenting these relatively rich entry and exit um, patterns. But one thing we have looked at is changes in household income. And when they stop running a business, that is correlated with a decrease in overall household income. Um, so that's, I think, the closest we have to, to that question for now.